Hey, welcome to another episode of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl Stephanie Hardy. Thank you so much for listening to this 23rd episode. Um, There's a lot going on in wrestling. There's a lot going on this weekend alone with SummerSlam, NXT TakeOver 30, and so many other things that are happening in the wrestling landscape. So we're going to start with your regular news and gossip-ish, and I have a special interview with Big Smooth, a local independent wrestler from Burnham. Birmingham, Alabama, stand up, and I got your regular weekly recap. So stay tuned for the rest of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with Stephanie Hardy. Okay, so we're going to start with news and gossip-ish, and we're going to start with the news that broke on Monday with how WWE is using their Thunderdome at the Amway Center in Orlando, Florida for their forthcoming wrestling events going forward. Now, they officially announced that SummerSlam will take place at the Amway Center in Orlando and that WWE shows Raw and SmackDown will film, lit, will film there from now on with pyrotechnics, fireworks, and the whole nine yards. So, they'll also be using LED boards to include the fans digitally just like the NBA did when they started their games um, last month. So, fans can also get tickets at WWEThunderdome.com so they can be a part of it. And the one thing that I noticed is yesterday when I was watching SmackDown is the fact that with all the fans on the screen and with all the different decorations that they had all around with the pillars going up to the roof and the sign that said SmackDown on the top of the roof and everything, with their regular Titantron, it is literally an immersive experience and it's really beautiful. Like To me, it looked exactly like a art collage where you basically take pictures of different things and put them on a surface and glued them to a surface like that's really what it looked like and it was beautiful to actually witness to see all of the pictures and see all of the graphics of everybody's entrances show up on those things in the different colors so I really did enjoy it and I'm definitely looking forward to SummerSlam I actually signed up to be um, a part of the Thunderdome experience on SummerSlam so we'll see how that works technologically but if you don't see my face and that's perfectly fine but But just know I'm still enjoying SummerSlam with you um, if you're watching it on the WWE Network. Also in the news, we have Triple H addressing the Velveteen Dream accusations, absence, and return. So as you know, Velveteen Dream came back a couple weeks ago on NXT television to... Much of the chagrin of the WWE Universe and fans alike because they feel like in the midst of his accusations, he should not be back on television. And if you don't know what those accusations are, I'll let you, you know, Google those and look those up because I just won't speak about it here. But Triple H did address it. And he said that as WWE investigated it, that they didn't find anything. And he's quoted to say, you know, in this day today, accusations are made and you take them all very seriously. You look into them the best you can and you find out what there is and what there isn't. In this situation, um, Velveteen Dream was also involved in a car accident. That's what took him off television. In the moment, all this other stuff happens and you look into it and you find that there is a situation that people bring to everyone's attention. You look into it and find that there that there is what it is and there is nothing there. Everything we have done, we are comfortable with him continuing to do what he does and everything else. But he had a car accident. It stemmed down to people thought we removed him from TV for different reasons. We didn't. He was in a car accident. Once he was medically cleared to be able to return to the ring from his car accident, we continued for it the way we did. We looked into what was there and we didn't find anything. So even though... Triple H released that statement and said that there was nothing to be found and that the reason that he was kept off of TV for so long was because he was um, recovering from his car accident. That really didn't satisfy a lot of fans online because on Twitter, you had a whole lot of people saying that they felt like he shouldn't have been back on television simply because of the accusations that were made and all of the above. But honestly, what I feel like is, is the WWE is a publicly traded company. Um, if there, if there were any accusations of abuse that came to be founded and to, and it, and it came to have the truth with them, I really feel that they would have just fired him 
or just suspended him for a longer period of time. Because in the midst of the speaking out movement that took place earlier this summer, there were people who were involved in those accusations. And when those accusations came to be true, they fired those people. They got rid of those people. They wanted nothing to do with it. So I'm pretty sure that if that no matter how big of a star Velveteen Dream is, that if those accusations were true, they would have kept him off television or possibly fired him. So I'm choosing to believe that somehow or another the best was done in this situation and that um Velveteen Dream will go on to possibly live this down at some point and if justice is to be served in that aspect if he was guilty of anything that justice will be served but since he's back on television I'm just going to choose to sort of relax and just you know, enjoy my weekend and not really worry so much about it anymore because now he's in the NXT North American title match. And hey, I mean, that's just what we have to deal with now. And I'm just choosing to believe that the best was, you know, dealt with in that situation. And then if not, then of course, you know, WWE deserves to be held accountable for it. So moving right along, we have um, the unfortunate passing of Xavier, not Xavier Woods from the New Day, but another independent wrestler by the name of Xavier who passed away at the age of 43. He was a former Ring of Honor champion whose real name was John Bedoya, and he became the second Ring of Honor champion in 2002 by beating Lokai, and he held the title for 182 days before losing it to Samoa Joe, who is now a commentator on WWE Raw and a superstar in his own right. He went on to make appearances on WWE television between 2003 and 2007 as a mid-card talent on secondary shows like Sunday Night Heat and Velocity. And Xavier was scheduled to make an appearance at a past versus present show um, match between Jay Lethal, who is an independent wrestling legend, but the event was canceled due to the pandemic. So we send our thoughts and prayers and good vibes to his family. And I pray that he is receiving the rest that he deserves from whatever it was that was going on. And also in some other disturbing and sad news, Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose were the victims of an attack on Sonya Deville's home by a crazed fan. And it was also a kidnapping attempt that was taking place between a fan who literally tried to come in and invade their home and kidnap them. So according to the statement, this this man named Philip A. Thomas II, who, by the, who is 24 years old, was arrested Sunday morning um, in an apparent kit kidnapping attempt at Sonya Deville's house and the Tampa Bay Times reported that investigators did not identify the victim but the home where the suspect was arrested was owned by Daria Baronetto and Thomas had never met Sonya Deville before but he stalked her on social media and the Hillsborough County Sheriff Sheriff's office said that Thomas began planning the abduction eight months ago and that he was inside Sonia DeVille's home when the police arrived. But she took to social media to reveal that everyone was safe. And she's and it's just so scary that something like this will happen. He was charged um, with aggravated stalking, armed burglary of a dwelling and an, an attempted armed kidnapping and criminal mischief. And what was so scary about this situation is the fact that he was carrying knives, plastic zip ties, duct tape, and mace, and said that he planned on taking the homeowner hostage. What upsets me about this is that you have your passionate wrestling fans who love the product and who love their favorite wrestlers all the time in a pure way in which they want to meet them or pot or quite possibly connect with them online because I've actually been lucky enough to meet some of my favorite wrestlers and actually connect with them online and on Twitter and stuff like that but never in a million years did I ever go to an extreme to where I wanted to you know go to their house and quite possibly do bodily harm to them simply because they weren't showing me any attention that is bothersome and I also learned yesterday as I was listening to the Jobbers Tears podcast that um, two of their co-hosts, well, one of the one of the co-hosts, Janelle, shout out to you, and 
another person, another guest that they had by the name of Hearts from Talk of Champions podcast had actually dealt with creeps before who sent them all kinds of disgusting, ugly pictures or accosted them out in public simply because, you know, they wanted to go out with them or stuff like that. And that bothers me because as a fellow podcaster and as a fellow fan, you can't just invade people's space like that just because you feel like you have access to them on social media or access to them on television. That's really gross. And you have to understand that these are human beings. We are human beings and we have boundaries. And if you can't respect those boundaries, then maybe you need to seek some help and just get away. Like, it's just disgusting that this person would just roll up and roll up to Sonya Deville's house and try to put Sonya in danger and Mandy Rose in danger because she was, you know, staying at the house herself. And the fact that these women were able to come on television last night because SmackDown was live last night and still work in spite of everything that happened is a miracle and a testament to how professional they are and how strong they are. But I really hope that after SummerSlam and after their match, which is going to be a no disqualification match and the loser leaves WWE match, they will take the time that they need to recover from this situation. And these women are human beings, even though they're strong and they're capable of defending themselves, they're still human beings. And no woman wants to be accosted living on their own by someone who doesn't respect boundaries. And if you are a wrestling fan, be the kind of wrestling fan that understands boundaries. Don't accost them in airports. Don't roll up on them at their house. Don't roll up on them in traffic. Let them live their lives just like we're living our lives. Okay? Okay? Chill, guys, please. Um, (laughs) I'm sorry I had to get bucked like that, but some people just don't understand. Um, they're humans, leave them alone. Um, and also the last thing on the docket in terms of news and gossip is just that Renee Young, who has been a broadcaster for WWE for about nine years, I, I believe right about now, is rumored to be leaving WWE after SummerSlam. Um, this came out, I believe earlier in the week and What I find is that I find it strange that she hasn't said anything about it yet on social media. So a part of me wants to wait until she actually confirms it. But if it's true that she actually is leaving, because even Paul Heyman released a statement about it and talked about how much of a professional she was with him. I hate that she's leaving because what she brought was a sense of professionality to her job and a sense of enthusiasm that, um, that is very rare as a broadcaster and I'm going to miss her very much. She made a lot of history. She had her show unfiltered with Renee Young on the WWE network. She was the co-host of talking smack in its first iteration and how amazing that was and the cool moments that they had on that show, especially with the Daniel Bryan and the Miz and their little um, promo where they basically talked about how much they hated each other. And you also had, her becoming the first female commentator on Monday Night Raw and there was just so much that she was able to do and even recently with WWE backstage she was able to show more of her personality there so if it's true that she is leaving I hope and pray nothing but continued success for her and I hope that She'll continue to be as enthusiastic and as beautiful as she was here in WWE, and I wish her nothing but the best. So that's the end of the news and gossip-ish segment on this show. And now we're going to go to an interview with Big Smooth. Thank you for coming on my show. I really appreciate it. Oh, oh yeah. Thank th- thank you for uh, re- reaching out to me. Yes. So I'm going to start this interview by asking you a question I ask all my guests. And that's, when did you fall in love with wrestling? Well, um, I would say that I had started really, really lo- lo- loving re- wrestling from a very young age. Um, I would... I always re- re- remember fr- Friday nights sit- sitting, sitting there uh, with with my grand granddad, just like watching old uh, older wrestling shows and everything. Like that had re- really de- developed 
that that that, that love that had carried on throughout life. Okay. So when did you know that you wanted to pursue it as a career? Well, um, it is so, something that that I always want want wanted to, to go out for, but it was it, it was just so, something that I did didn't have like any any clue of like how how to start. Um, I would say that I got got really serious about it upon graduating co- co- college. Um, I was working job job after job not like really feel, feeling full so mm. one day I, I just searched searched on, online for on re- wrestling schools near, near near nearby and I found f- found me one and that was around 2017 and I started training in 2018 and it's been been going on ever since then Okay, so with that, um, how did you find out about Victory Championship Wrestling and what was that type of training like going into yeah. it, you know, as a new um, wrestler? Yeah, um, so so I, I, I was on, on like fa- fa- Facebook one day just like search, searching for like re- wrestling schools near near me. Um, I hit, hit up some that, that was semi, semi-close, but they were... Um, outside side of my my price 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 range, so um so, someone told told me about a wrestling school in in you know, Mumford Alabama or whatever. So I, I had showed up for a for 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 a, a show, and um after after that I just waited around, uh found found me some some someone to actually talk to or whatever. And um, from there, I had started training in January 20, 2018. And I would say that that first day of, of, of training was just the most awkward experience that I ever had. Like just first, first off, just step, stepping foot in a ring, something that I've always want, wanted to do since I, I was really, really little just to have like that like moment to be like wow i'm actually here and then my world got flipped upside down when i landed (laughs) straight on my head and i was like yep this is real so so that that like first like day was rough but it it was something i i was willing to like stick stick out through and and like learn and everything and it's been one of the best things that I've ever done in my life. Okay. So I have one question. Like, how did you create the persona of Big Smooth? And how did you come up with that name? Um, yeah, let's just stop there. Like, how did you come up with that name? Because I thought that was really interesting when I found you and looked you up. I was like, that's a really interesting name for a wrestler. So how did you come up with that and your persona? Yeah, Um. well... That'll that that'll take me back to the ninth uh, grade. I was a student at Ram, Ram, Ramsey High, High School uh, here here in in the Birmingham area, mm-hmm. and like back back back, back then, uh, cell phones weren't weren't like really allowed in like school or whatever. Mm-hmm. So so it was my second period mm-hmm. history class. Um, the te- teachers going going over. This is this is blah 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 hi, hi, history class, and there will be absolutely zero phones in this cl- classroom. And as soon as he said that, guess who whose phone rings? Mine. Oh so I'm wow! Like, yeah. <laughs> so me, being me, I slid it out of my out out of my own pocket. It was this big boot boost on mo, mo, mobile church phone. Picked it up, opened it up, said, "Hey, I'm gonna have to call you back." Hung it up, slid the phone right back in my in, in my pocket, and acted acted like nothing even had, had happened. And the 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 on t- teacher just laughed his ass off and. <laughs> And, and like he 
he had said, man, that was the smooth, smoothest thing I ever seen in my life. And from now on, your your name is Big Smooth. And it's just a name that is stuck since then. Okay. That's a really funny story. Um, because <laughs> it, it took <laughs> me back to high school. I went to Fairfield here. So okay. it's just like it's just like that just took me back to where how people would literally like make it so cell phones just were not a thing, you know, mm-hmm. in school or whatever. And if they caught you with one, that was like it. That was the end of everything. Yep. Oh my gosh. But what's so funny is I never had a cell phone. Like I didn't have a cell phone until I graduated high school. Oh wow. So yeah, so I never really had that issue. It was all I was always watching everybody else because mm-hmm. I just didn't have a cell phone right then. So it was just like, yeah, this is a big deal, but I can't relate. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I also wanted to ask you, like, how did you come up with your persona in the ring because I actually did watch a couple of your um videos and your promos and it mm-hmm. seems like you got a whole lot of confidence oh <laughs> so yeah so much so <laughs> to the point that you call yourself the modern blessing of professional professional wrestling mm-hmm. and you also called yourself the melanated master so oh, where yeah. did those things come from well I have always been a very very con- con- confident per- person um I have always been big and and brown. So with 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 that, I have always had jokes, joke jokes thrown out at, at me. So from a very young age, I had figured out it is it, it is either cry or crack back at Adam. So with with, with that, she, the con- company start started flowing. From a very very young young age, and um, with with the whole per, per, persona, persona thing, um, my 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 own tra- trainers I, I always tell me that that the best on char- characters are like you you but but turned all the way up. So so on um, pretty pre- pretty much smooth is is like me, but times. Twin, twin, twenty. So all the character goes up, the quote unquote cockiness co- co- goes up, the style go go goes up. So like it's 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 like me, but just more. Okay, that's cool. So what is the independent wrestling culture like here in Alabama? Because you know they really don't have that many shows that really come through Birmingham itself, but. Mm-hmm. You know, I just want to know exactly what the culture is like in other parts of Alabama since you've been wrestling. Yeah, um, actually, um, it, it, it's a couple, couple shows go go on uh, through throughout the state, and um, here I would say, um, as far as ta- ta- talent le- level goes, it's a lot of talented guys that have been wor- working five, ten plus years who can really put put on a great show um the only thing i i would w- wish would would like change is like all, all of, of 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 the like side 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 companies about this show does this this per- per- person isn't good at that blah 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 pretty pre- pretty much wrestling is full of high school drama and it and it needs to be be gone cut out very very soon but but for 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 the overall talent aspect of it it's a lot of talented folks here that's really interesting that you would say that because you would think that there really wouldn't be like high school drama in in that independent wrestling because you see so much of that drama I guess sort of take place when it comes to more of the mainstream promotions which mm-hmm. I will ask you about later but it's like it plays out over social media because on because it's on a grander scale so right. it's kind of interesting to hear that that type of dynamic actually goes on in independent wrestling but or at least here in Alabama you know for the most part and you're not the first independent wrestler that said that you know that I've talked to because in my past episodes I have talked to like two others and they mm-hmm. sort of mentioned 
the idea of there being a little bit of negative negativity in that as you know with that but you know as far i feel like as long as you're pressing through all of that and you know doing you then that's really all that should matter right um, so yeah um i also want to ask you since we're going to switch gears a little bit um since the pandemic has happened there have been some independent wrestlers who found you know have been basically struggling with finding work because mm. of the lack of the live shows like how have you been able to cope with it well um from from a, a actual fi fi net, net natural stand standpoint um i am truly tru truly truly blessed to have have have, have a, a like a quote unquote shoot shoot job where where like, i can still still main, main, maintain bills and and all of that um as far as far as, as like shows um i was kind of, kind of down down about about it start starting out but after after sitting out for about two or three months, like it, it had actually been, been been benefit fitted me, um, because those those like net net nagging pains that that we all all have because re, re, wrestling has zero all off season, so you're constantly pushing, constantly hurting, constantly sore, all, all of that. So I had ha, having that that like period just to rest. And to re recuperate your joint joints and everything was really really help helpful. And then also with, with with that, it had gave gave me time to be more so cre creative too, like figuring out how can I still stay re 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 relevant without actually going to a to a show. How can I still make make big 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 smooth a brand so with 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 that um i was putting out pro promo videos um brand 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 new merchant merchandise and i i even started my own web, web website too so so that that like downtime really helped help 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 me to sharp sharpen up those like skills that that on no no one re really fo focuses on Okay. Well, it's good to see that you've actually, you know, created an outlet in the midst of all that. And it's good that you've been able to sort of keep yourself afloat in the midst of all this because everybody's been trying to pivot and readjust and everything. And I'm glad that you've, you know, found your niche outside of wrestling as well. And I know you probably miss it too. So, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, hope, let, let the show, shows are, are like starting to pick, pick, pick up more. And I have worked on three shows since July now. So we're start, starting to pick, pick up more. Okay, that's good. So I have to ask this question because, you know, you're a budding, you're a budding wrestler and you're making waves and stuff. Um, do you have any interest in pursuing wrestling with a mainstream promotion like WWE, AEW or Impact and the like? definitely um i am here to turn this to a real real real, real deal job where like i can have re re wrestler as actual career path um and i am open to any major company whether that be the wwe aw tna J J japan anywhere Sign, sign me ASAP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I'm pretty sure you'll have what it takes to make it. Oh yeah, hopefully. Yes. Now, who are some of your favorite wrestlers, male or female, from any era? Uh, I would say my current favorite has has to be C Cesaro. He is an absolute beast in the ring. He can work with any per person with any 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 style or anything. Um, um, as far as like oh, oh, older guys, I am pretty pre pretty sure that 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 that, that I, I fit in with basically everybody. When I say Stone Cold Steve Austin was that guy, he was 
he he, he had re- re- really got, got got me to the point where I was like, yeah, this is what I want want to do. So yeah. Okay. Do you have any female um favorites? Uh, fe- fe- female favorites. Um, if I'm spe- speaking current current currently, I'm really di- digging uh be young Uncle Be Belair style that like power 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 powerful a- athlete style. I really like 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 that going on for her. Okay, she's actually one of my favorites too. I actually patterned one of my episodes, you know, after her. Um, with her moment that she had an NXT takeover in Portland where she came mm-hmm. out with the outfit that said Black History in the Making. Mm-hmm. Like, I named one of my episodes after that and she's definitely one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. She she will definitely be be, be a, a, a on our fu- future champ because she has it all. Yep. Okay, so as I was watching some of your uh, matches on YouTube and stuff, I noticed that a lot of your style seems like it's if it, it's reminiscent of the Big Show and Mark Henry, and mm-hmm. I wanted and I had to, and I had to know like who is your biggest inspiration as a wrestler in terms of ability or you know anybody that you pattern yourself after. Yeah, um, I I, I would de- definitely throw throw in those those guys in in the top top ten guys who who I actually. Fo- fo- focus on like film for um i would I'll also throw in uh pe- people like Va- Va- vader um in M- M- mvp bam bam bam, bam B- bigelow and um i also st- study ray ray ray's ra- 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 film hmm. those are really interesting um choices but they're really but they're really good choices in the sense that they you have a lot to pull from in terms of their ability because they weren't just big men they also knew how to move so right. that's really those are really good you know choices and definitely raise Mar- ramon is a great choice too even though he wasn't exactly a big big guy he still mm-hmm. you know he was still able to do what he needed to do in the ring as well definitely so i have one more question for you okay so what does the future hold for big smooth future for 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 me um in in a in an ideal world is i am signed to a major company in the next on uh, year and then fo- fo- following that just work working my, my my way up through through, through the ranks winning championship by the championship by the championship and hopefully one day make making it to to that also covered in Hall, Hall, Hall of Fame spot. Good deal. Well, personally, as a person from Birmingham and Fairfield, Alabama, I just got to say thank you so much for coming on my show. And I really hope and pray that you continue your successful run as a champion and to just continue to follow your dreams because so many people start their dreams and then just give up on it or they feel like their dream is just, you know, oh well it's like their childhood dream and then they just sort of you know shrink it once they hit adulthood so I Mm -hmm. definitely commend you for doing that especially um down here down south where a lot of where a lot of wrestlers have a tendency to come from different places like Georgia or Florida and stuff like that but rarely do you ever see anybody from Alabama you know make it that big so I really hope and pray you make it and you know continue to have success in that so with that being said, just tell everybody where they can find you, follow you, or where they can purchase your merchandise and all of the above. You know, just put yourself over. Oh yeah, de- de- definitely. You can find everything for the modern blessing of professional wrestling at bigsmooth.com. And that's B-I-G-S-M-U-V-E dot com. Um, you can fo- follow me on so- social media. Um, I'm on in, in, in Instagram at Big Smooth, uh, fa- fa- Facebook the same, and on Twitter at Big uh, underscore Smooth. Thank you so much, Big Smooth, for coming on the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. Thank you for for, for having me. It's been very fun. Good.
Okay, so we're going to go to Raw. We're going to recap everything that happened on Raw. Of course, this is the go-home Raw before SummerSlam and everything that's taking place with that. So we're going to start with the women, of course. So Demi Burnett, who is on Bachelor in Paradise, was flirting with freaking Angel Garza <laughs> and Ivar, I guess, and... Angelo Dawkins at this point and I'm kind of upset about it because she's coming and throwing a wrench in the Angel Charlie ship that I had put forth in my mind which set and it's just it's just making me so upset because it's almost like Charlie isn't even really like on Raw really dealing with Angel anymore and it makes me sad because I really wanted them to actually get together and be a thing kind of to fulfill like this Lillian Garcia rock romance that never happened and I just I'm just upset about it (laughs) so Ivar so with that Ivar and Angel got into a match because of Demi flirting but I'll get into that later um Mickey James and Natalia um had a match this was Mickey James's first match in over a year because she was out with injury and her and Natalia have got this fight going on this little beef going on because Natalia um is sort of threatened by the idea that Mickey James wants to be like a locker room leader since she's like an OG in the game now and of course Natalia is an OG but she's sort of finding relevance with more social media stuff with Lana also as her manager and It's kind of weird to see someone, you know, as old as Natalia trying to hold on, you know, to relevancy with that. But at the same time, it's kind of interesting in a sense because she's kind of serving into the celebrity part of herself with the whole Total Divas thing. Um, So they fought in a match, but the match, you know, started off hot with um, Mickey James just sort of taking advantage. But... Natalia was taking advantage of distractions by Lana, but the match really didn't get that much time because Seth Rollins came out and sort of distracted with him and Murphy going out to accost Samoa Joe over the Rey Mysterio Dominic um, confrontations that they've been having. And what upset me about this was the fact that you have Mickey James, who hasn't wrestled in so long, coming back, and then she winds up she winds up losing the match. But what upsets me the most is the fact they didn't get that much time to fight and they were and the time that they were given to fight that attention was taken and put on Seth Rollins. And as much as the intersection of the men and women happen now on wrestling, it's just that I just don't necessarily like how the Seth segment was taking away from the Mickey and Natalia segment. These two women are two of the best that they have in terms of longevity and in terms of what they've been able to do with the women's revolution. And they deserve a whole lot better than to have their spotlight taken away, you know, because one other story by the men are being magnified. And of course, on social media, a lot of people did take to take offense to that. And I don't blame them for being mad about that. So hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll get a longer and better match with Mickey James and Natalia being the absolute best that they can be. So that's what happened with that. Also, we had a tag team match between the golden role models, Bailey and Sasha versus Asuka and Shayna Baszler. Now, Bailey and Sasha, you know, were t- talking all of their stuff, talking about how they're going to beat Asuka at SummerSlam because, as you know, Asuka is going up against the both of them for both the Raw and SmackDown women's titles. But Shayna Baszler interrupted them and came out and said that no matter who wins on Sunday, she is next in line for um, an opportunity for whatever title. Now, Asuka came out there and they both basically ambushed um, Bailey and, Bailey and Sasha to start this tag team match. But it, they were somewhat interrupted with the presence of Nia Jax, who's been suspended, but yet somehow finds herself back on television over and over again. And she was coming out to confront um, Shayna Baszler. And Nia Jax wound up knocking down a piece of plexiglass before um, all the officials came out, including Pat Buck, who she had, you know, a confrontation with a couple weeks ago. And then Nia and Baszler were just fighting out to the back and basically left Asuka to basically fight Sasha and Bailey by herself. And she wound up 
you know, holding her own in that match. But there was a point where Sasha came close to winning the match with the Meteora before um, Bailey kind of just started beating up on Asuka yet again. But then Asuka was locked in the bank statement at a certain point between, you know, but then after that point, Shayna Baszler came out finally to, you know, inter- to basically like be the partner that Asuka needed. And she broke up the bank statement and Baszler ended up making Bailey tap out with the Kirafuda clutch. And this was a really good showing, even though it started off kind of shaky with Shayna Baszler being, you know, distracted by Nia Jax. But I was glad that she was able to come back out to get the win over Bailey, you know, and show that she is actually capable of winning matches because it was kind of strange how last SmackDown she was in the Battle Royal to qualify to face Bailey, but she wound up losing um, to Asuka. So it was nice to see that she was able to actually have Asuka's back in that. But of course, you know, that might not last long if Asuka wins one of those titles. So, hey, that was pretty cool. And also um, with the women's division, you have Ruby Riot versus Peyton Royce. And I don't know if they're teasing a possible breakup of the Iconics, but Billy Kay was originally scheduled to fight Ruby Riot, um, but she claimed that her shoulder wasn't feeling right, and she offered up Peyton Royce as her replacement. And Peyton was surprised at this, but she went ahead, you know, and you know took her partner's place. And Riot had tackled Peyton Royce after the bell and took her down with a standing STO. She was like angry about that. She took her frustrations out on um, Peyton Royce. And then Liv Morgan and Billy Kay were watching from ringside. And somehow or another, Peyton Royce hit a huge knee to Ruby Riot's head. But then she wound up shoving Ruby Riot into Liv Morgan, causing a misunderstanding between the two. And then she hit her twisting DDT finisher in order to win the match. And I'm really glad that the Iconics are sort of getting a little bit of a push, um, but it's also a little bit of a pull because it's almost like you they're insinuating the fact that they may be breaking up, but they've also sort of put forth the idea that maybe Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan um, might break up yet again. But I feel like that would be weird seeing as they just got back together and it would just be counterproductive if they broke up all over again. So I hope that Ruby Wright and Liz stay together, but the Iconics, if they stay together, then that would be fine. But then if they don't, that would still be kind of intriguing because all we've ever seen them as is best friends. So to see them sort of break up would just be kind of interesting, but you know, we'll just have to wait and see with that. And also with the women, you had um, the debut of Marina Shafir and Jessamine Duke, who are half of the four horsewomen of the MMA, um, make their debut on Raw Underground. This was really cool to see because they are the type of fighters that would flourish in an atmosphere like Raw Underground because that's, you know, that's their niche. That's kind of their rough and tumble, you know, background. And to see them sort of fight with Shayna Baszler and sort of fight off Nia Jax, who decided to come down, you know, to try to beat up on Shayna Baszler a whole lot more was really good for that because something that I always, you know, wondered was if women were going to participate. And these are the type of women who really need to participate. And of course, Nia Jax was shoving Shayna Baszler and wound up kicking Jessamine Duke, you know, away. But then when she had when she was challenged by Shayna Baszler to come in the ring, she walked off and said, you know, I don't need this. Nope, nope, nope. And I kept feeling like, Naya, this isn't the place for you. <laughs> like, she's more comfortable, I guess, I'm more comfortable seeing her in a wrestling ring because I know that's where she flourishes the most sometimes. Um, then she would be in a hardcore atmosphere like Raw Underground. So I, so I was just like, Naya, you don't want any of them in that atmosphere. Stop it. But it was still cool to see. But then also, you have the revealing of Zelina Vega um, as the one who poisoned Montez Ford. And even though she tried to deny it over and over again as that footage came out, um, there's no denying that, man. We saw you in your gorgeous outfit, you know, that you have more than one color of, poison Montez Ford and just like... Bianca Belair suspected so 
always believe us, number one. And number two, Bianca Belair is going to come for you and destroy you. So (laughs) that's pretty much all that happened with the women. And I'm ready to see if Zelina Vega and Bianca Belair are going to fight again because that was really cool to see. So the show started with the men and it started with Drew McIntyre coming out and addressing Randy Orton's actions towards Ric Flair and how he attacked him after Ric Flair told him how much he loved him and stuff. And he was talking about, you know, how you know ridiculous and how ugly it was. But while this was going on, you had retribution, you know, taking over the technology the, the technology truck and breaking cameras and all of the above. And it was kind of awkward to see you know, the superstars, you know, reacting to this happening while Drew McIntyre has no clue what's going on. But then Retribution just basically just destroyed the truck. And as this was going on, and after McIntyre, you know, realized what was happening, he, you know, joined the superstars and trying to get them together. But then MVP came out and his music started playing, but you didn't see his entrance um, graphics at all until maybe five or 10 minutes into the entrance. And he was upset. So he issued a warning to Retribution and he tried to blame Apollo Crews and mentioned how the group only showed up around the same time him and Crews started feuding with each other. So it's like he MVP is blaming Apollo for retribution coming but you know he's just mad because they got a match this Sunday so whatever which led to Apollo Crews and Shelton Benjamin having a match against each other and this match was pretty good um and it was relatively short simply because of the fact you had distractions of our truth running through the middle of the ring with Akira Tozawa and his ninjas with the 24 7 title business and then it allowed Apollo Crews to roll up Benjamin for the victory but then MVP and Shel- and um Bobby Lashley and Shelton attacked him and then tried to lock um Apollo Crews into the full Nelson which they're calling the full Lashley now until Cedric Alexander, Mustafa Ali, and Ricochet came to Apollo's defense. And then MVP challenged um, Apollo and two other people of his choosing in a six-man tag. And Apollo wound up choosing um, Ricochet and Mustafa, which left Cedric Alexander out because he wanted to participate. But he said, but Apollo was like, no, you need to stay back here. You're injured. You know, just chill. And MVP actually later on in the night tried to insinuate that Apollo was undermining Cedric, but Cedric wasn't hearing it. He wasn't having it. But all MVP kept saying was, you know, if you join the Hurt Business, you won't have to be in catering anymore, which is his go to insult for people who have potential but aren't being used on television. So that was really interesting. So who knows? Maybe Cedric might join the Hurt Business. Maybe not. Like it's. I feel like it would be cool if he did, though. It would be dastardly, and it would be a good t- good heel turn for him. But then Angel Garza and Ivar fought because of the fight over Demi Burnett from Bachelor in Paradise. And Garza took control right away, and then he um, kept Ivar grounded for a bit. But then Angelo was talking to Demi backstage. And that, you know, made him feel some type of way once they put it on the Titantron. And Ivar quickly made a comeback and ran Garza from corner to corner. But then Andrade came out, was out there with him, and then provided a small distraction so he could hit a drop kick for the win. So Angel wound up beating Ivar, getting some revenge on him. But um, this was also where they led to watching um, Montez... um, Montez's drink get poisoned by Zelina Vega with that footage so that was interesting so they're basically beefing up their raw tag team feud um championship feud at SummerSlam which I predict that maybe Angel and Andrade might just win now I love my Street Profits now and I love Bianca Belair but I really feel like Angel and Andrade just deserve a title run as tag team champions at this point and I just predict that they might win. So that's going to be interesting to see. And then we have the Revenge of the Mysterios. Um, Ray and Dominic came out together so Ray could talk to his son about his match with Rollins at SummerSlam. And he said that seeing his son suffer was worse than what happened to him at Extreme Rules where, you know, he had got his eye attacked. But he said not being able to protect his son filled him with more rage than he ever has before. 
And he said that he was going to be in Dominic's corner Sunday so he could see his son beat him in a street fight. But Dominic replied and said, you know, I love you, Hefe, because <laughs> that's his nickname for him, which I think is really cool. Um, he's, um, but he said that it would be an honor to have you in my corner, but I'm going to beat Seth Rollins. And then, of course, Seth came out. Uh, well, he didn't come out. He came on the big three and basically got in Ray's face you know, for putting his son in danger and talked about how bad of a parent he was. And I think it's funny how Ray, the actual um, veteran in parenting, you know, is being called out for his parenting skills when Seth is a parent, you know, in waiting. <laughs> and you have this parent in waiting throwing shade at you for how bad of a parent you are. And you're you're like a parent to like two kids, Shout out to Aaliyah, who just had a birthday. But it's just like, how are you going to talk about how bad of a parent Ray is when you're when your baby's still cooking in the oven? Chill out. Um, <laughs> so basically, Ray came out. Well, Ray, not Ray came out. Seth came out and tried to like get in their faces. But they were able to get revenge because as Ray was distracting Seth, Dominic was able to get two kendo sticks and they were able to beat the crap out of Murphy and Seth the same way they they did to Dominic and that was really cool to see so who knows maybe in this street fight you know they'll break out more kendo sticks more chairs and kill each other who knows but I really want Dominic to win he has his own t-shirt now like I want I'm interested in seeing what his gear is gonna look like you know I'm ready for him to stand on his own two feet because the first time we ever saw him have anything to do with SummerSlam it had to do with Ray versus Eddie Guerrero rest in peace um with the custody match and he was a little boy back then and now he's a big grown man so that's gonna be cool so along with that near the end of the show you had Shawn Michaels come out and talk about um how much he loves Ric Flair as we all do as a trailblazer in the business and basically he was talking about how Orton didn't appreciate what it was like to have Ric Flair as a mentor. And as he was about to leave the ring, the Viper hit him with an RKO out of nowhere and followed it up with a punt kick before McIntyre chased him away. And then when Orton tried to return, when when Drew had his back turn, um, Drew saw him coming and then beat him all around the ring. And then he went back to check on Shawn Michaels, which gave Orton the opportunity to hit the RKO to end the show. So, huh, Drew is out for revenge to possibly, you know, revenge on behalf of Sean and Rick as legends in the business. And Randy is out to prove himself as a champion and as a leg legend killer as he's been. And it's just interesting to see this, you know, take place. But at the same time, I'm wondering if Drew is going to have more to show for his championship reign you know, besides, you know, trying to take revenge on people, you know, for being, you know, beat up by Randy. And I'm interested in seeing Randy do something else besides be the legend killer. But I can't say that the legend killer gimmick isn't um, interesting. So along with that, you had Dolph Ziggler fighting um, in Raw Underground, which I think is interesting because if he's not going to be participating in a main storyline on the show, then by all means, let him show his skills as a wrestler and as a grappler on Raw Underground. And then you had Montez Ford and Andrade fight in a match. But as Bianca was, as Bianca Belair came out, as Zelina Vega was trying to distract, Ford was able to roll them up for the pin. So that's still giving that entry to the Raw Tag Team title match at SummerSlam. So that's all that happened on Raw. And now we're going to go to NXT. All right, so we're going to go to NXT. So with the women, of course, you had Candice LeRae coming out with her husband, um, Johnny Gargano, with his match versus Ridge Holland <laughs> um, from NXT UK. But I won't talk about that. I'll talk about that more in the men's part. So the first women's match we saw in NXT was between Dakota Kai and Jesse Kamea, who I believe is just uh, probably a newcomer um, to NXT. Um, but it was good to see her, you know, 
make her way in this match against Dakota Kai, who is a person with an axe to grind against Io Shirai for the NXT Women's Championship, who she's going to fight today um, at NXT TakeOver 30. So Jessie Kamea was showing her toughness against Dakota Kai, and she was kicking out after a sequence of impressive kicks from the captain of Team Kick. But she still wound up losing to um, the GTK, so Dakota Kai, you know, has all the momentum going into her match. So after this match, um, which was relatively short, Dakota Kai was taunting Io Shirai, basically saying that she was, that she loved that she loved how EO basically brought up her past and how she uses her friends or at least her former friends betrayals to build up you know her anger and sort of her animosity to motivate her to become this mean person but she's but basically since you know you're using all this against me I'm going to use all that against you in the match and I'm going to beat you for that title so Io Shirai came out and they ran out and fought each other outside of the ring but then as they were making their way up the ramp Raquel Gonzalez made a surprise return because I was playing the game of where in the world is Raquel Gonzalez anyway she was gone <laughs> she had been gone for a while so she came back and knocked Io Shirai out with a big boot and basically helped Dakota Kai lay her out you know so now we have this x factor in the match between Dakota Kai and Io Shirai because at first Dakota was saying oh I'm gonna fight by myself I don't need anybody to come out with me but it's pretty clear that she's gonna always need her diesel the same way that Shawn Michaels needed her his diesel so that's gonna be interesting to see today also with the women you had a tag team match between Rhea Ripley and Shotzi Blackheart who was reunited with her helmet this week versus Mercedes Martinez and Aaliyah now Shotzi and Aaliyah led this match a whole lot because I guess they were holding off on the inevitable um, locking of the horns between Rhea Ripley and Mercedes Martinez. Um, they were staring each other down throughout the entire match and literally Martinez only got into the action to basically isolate Blackheart from making a tag to Rhea Ripley. But then right, but then right when she got the hot tag. She ran over Aaliyah, but then Martinez attempted to save Aaliyah after she took a rip tide from Rhea Ripley. But Rhea Ripley power bombed um, Mercedes Martinez over the barricade over the, onto the concrete, which allowed for Blackheart to hit a diving senton on Aaliyah for the win. So basically, even though Rhea Ripley and Mercedes Martinez haven't been announced to fight at TakeOver this time, when they do fight, it's going to be amazing because these are two powerhouse women. And it would just be really cool to see how the evolved Rhea Ripley will fight against the ever more evolved Mercedes Martinez. Because the first time we bought, we both saw either of them was in the Mae Young Classic, the very first one. So I'm really interested to see how they're going to, you know, fight each other with their evolved selves. And Aaliyah shows constantly improve, constant improvement in her aggression and I hope that she just continues to get better so that's really all what happened with the women on NXT so with the men you had um the match between Johnny Gargano and Ridge Holland um to fight to have a place in the NXT North American title ladder match at TakeOver 30 and Ridge Holland came out with all of his power um, and basically had Johnny Gargano running away early there was this really weird spot where I think Johnny Gargano took a bump from either a suplex or something and it looked really bad and his neck looked like it, it he, he landed on his neck really weird but he was able to go forth with it um there after he was able to come to himself after that bump he um, was able to take advantage of a distraction from Candice LeRae with a low blow behind the referee's back, and he stole the victory with the one final beat. So now Johnny Gargano is in an NXT North American title ladder match. So we're going to get more with that action later on. And then we had Legado Del Fantasma versus Brizango and Isaiah Swerve Scott. So this match was basically your regular tag team match in NXT it was really good 
Um, the action basically broke down quickly as Brizongo could not hesitate. Um, after the action slowed down, they stood over Legado del Fantasma with a smile. But that quickly changed after Santos Escobar distracted Fandango and set up Joaquin Wilde to trip him up over the top rope. And they wore out Fandango's left arm that was injured a couple of weeks ago. And he fought his way um, slowly but surely to his partner's corner. And Isaiah Swerve Scott came in and went completely off on Santos Escobar. And Tyler Breeze accidentally tagged in after a collision with Swerve, potentially costing him a pinfall on Escobar. And um, Tyler Breeze was able to show more of his aggression here, but Escobar caught him with a phantom driver for the victory. And... Huh. <laughs> this is going to be interesting because I believe um, Swerve and Santos Escobar are going to be fighting for the Cruiserweight Championship at TakeOver 30 on today. And that's going to be really good to see because I really want to see Swerve Scott take Santos Escobar to the absolute limit. But seeing as he, Escobar has the upper hand with his two cronies coming out there to help him i don't know how much help um swerve is gonna have now in terms of brizongo um they're also going to fight for the nxt tag titles against um imperium and and raul and joaquin wild and that's going to be interesting to see with that triple threat also, we had the promo between Adam Cole and Pat McAfee. Pat McAfee came out there with his NFL friends. And I'm trying to figure out what that's supposed to do within the world of wrestling. What is that supposed to do for you to make you seem like a threat? Like, because we all know that if it came to a fight between Team NFL and the Undisputed Era, they're going to lose. <laughs> they're gonna lose so stop it um they decided so as they both decided to leave their boys outside the ring um because adam cole came out there with the undisputed era um pat mcafee was just running his mouth and saying that he was gonna work on a totally different level and said and he but he basically said that the two weeks of training that he had was going to circumvent all of was going to go over all of adam cole's years of experience and he just sounded like an idiot he sounded like a rank amateur i'm just like sir shut up so after he was saying all of this stuff adam cole got in his face without a microphone which i thought was very telling and he said that i i will beat you at nsc takeover and i'm gonna make you my little b word and i was just like yes <laughs> and then he laid out security as they came out to try to break them up and he beat them up and he did it and him and the Undisputed Era beat up security to basically let McAfee know that this isn't what you want to play with, son. Like, Adam Cole is going to sun you in front of everybody, so stop it. And we had the last match of the night, which was the NXT North American title qualifier between Finn Balor and Velveteen Dream. And Dream came out dressed like a Dennis Rodman character. Like, he came out, like, he dyed his beard blonde, even though he had that last week. But he came out dressed in, like, red fishnet stuff, and he was just kind of being flamboyant or whatever. And he was just giving me mad Dennis Rodman vibes. And what my boyfriend noticed as we were watching it together, um, shout out to Najakwin, he said that in this match Velveteen Dream was starting off kind of slow which was the same way Dennis Rodman started off in one of his matches in WCW back in the day and I thought that was a really interesting observation so um kudos to you babe um <laughs> he said so after that happened um Finn Balor isolated the left leg of Velveteen Dream and Velveteen Dream wound up fighting back afterward. But then Cameron Grimes came out to taunt both men by climbing the ladder and, and you know, grabbing the NXT title in North American title and saying that this was going to be his. And as Velveteen Dream was losing focus, um, Finn Balor was taking more advantage of him. But then Grimes distracted Balor, though, which 
made Vel- which basically made Velveteen Dream take advantage of that distraction and set him up for a superplex. But then Johnny Gargano tripped Grimes off of the ladder, causing the referee to go down. And then Balor and Dream took out Cameron Grimes before all the chaos happened. And then Bronson Reed and Damian Priest came out and laid out Johnny Gargano. And then to Damian Priest kicked the thick boy. And then Timothy Thatcher came out and attacked Finn Balor and set up, which set up the Velveteen Dream to hit a Death Valley driver and a Purple Rainmaker for the win. So now Velveteen Dream is in the ladder match, much to the chagrin of everybody in the world. <laughs> and um, Bronson Reed took out everybody and stood tall with the North American Championship. So this was an amazing setup. Even though it was chaotic, it was an amazing setup for the title match on this set today. And I'm going to say that I want Damian Priest to win this ladder match because I feel like he's had a lot of stop and starting in NXT. And when it comes to um, Velveteen Dream and Johnny Gargano, like they both really don't need that title because they've had it, you know, multiple times. So I'm I'm kind of over them winning it. But then I also feel like Bronson Reed and Cameron Grimes are really the two hungriest people in the match because they're looking to prove themselves amongst all of these giants. So this is going to be interesting to see. So today is NXT TakeOver 30. It's the 30th one. It's pretty historic. So please watch down the WWE Network. And now we're going to go to SmackDown. Right, so we're gonna recap SmackDown emanating from the Thunderdome, 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 Third Dome, Mr. Thunderdome, 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 Mr. Thunderdome, Thunderdome, Thunderdome. It came live from the Thunderdome, which is the Amway Center, which I already discussed in News and Gossip Ish. If you haven't seen it, you know, I suggest you rewatch SmackDown or better yet, look at the video WWE Fox um posted of it it is absolutely beautiful look at it marvel at it love it so with the women um it started with Corey graves doing an interview with bailey and sasha and he's the consummate instigator so he came out and asked them the question are you guys breaking up and they said no and they pretty much bragged on how they're gonna run through oscar you know at SummerSlam, and said that nobody in that locker room can beat them or be the both of them to which Naomi came out and replied, look, if y'all looking for somebody who could be the both of y'all, you know, I can do it. And Corey suggested that maybe they should fight in a beat the clock challenge. So they did. And it started with Sasha and basically um, whoever lost their beat the clock challenge would have to face Oscar first at SummerSlam. So it had that um, implication behind it. So Sasha Banks fought Naomi first and it was really good to see these two fight each other, even if it was only for maybe three minutes and 18 seconds. But the match was really good. And Sasha wound up coming out with the win with the bank statement. She made Naomi tap out and in the midst of that, you know, Sasha ran off to let Bailey, of course, you know, beat, you know, come to the ring and beat her, you know, and try to do it in a quick fashion, you know, but it didn't work because Naomi kept fighting back, you know, but for every inch that Naomi would try to fight back, Bailey would always, you know, bounce and get the advantage yet again. But then Naomi hit her with the rear view and hit her for the one, two, three. And something that I thought was very interesting after Bailey lost her match was the fact that Sasha was laughing outside of the ring um, at Bailey losing. And basically now Bailey has to fight Oscar first at SummerSlam on tomorrow for her for the SmackDown Women's Championship. So as she was laughing and as she was going in there to try to fake support Bailey at this point, Oscar came out there and then Sasha ran out towards Oscar to try to beat her up. And then Oscar hit her with a kick and then ran out to the ring and beat up on Bailey some more. And after that happened, you know, Bailey ran away with her two titles in her hands. But as she ran away, she ran up the ramp and left Sasha to sort of, you know, recover on her own until she realized what she had done. And then she helped. She finally helped her recover. And then Sasha told her to get her titles. So 
it's going to be really interesting on Sunday to see who's going to win what and who's going to lose what. Because either way, the rift between Bailey and Sasha is getting bigger and bigger. And I love it. And I think it's also ironic that this is also happening on the heels of the fifth anniversary of their iconic NXT TakeOver Brooklyn match against each other. So, uh-huh, timing is funny. So, <laughs> So also with the women, you had Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose. Mandy Rose was the first to say something, you know, with an interview with Kayla Braxton backstage. And she decided to sort of renege on her um, hair versus hair challenge and wanted to extend an olive branch to Sonya Deville, basically stating that she knows that the friend that she was friends with for so long um, is still within Sonya and that, you know, maybe they could repair their friendship. So Sonya was backstage and as she was getting ready to respond to what mandy said dana brooke ran up behind her and said you know i'm really sorry for what happened to you this week and then sonya was like i'm not and then she slapped the crap out of dana brooke as if to say i don't need your your um sympathy and she walked to the ring well not to the ring she walked to the titan tron and basically said that she knew that Mandy was going to go was going to go back on her promise for the hair versus hair match and she said that basically since that's you know too flimsy let's just up the ante and make the match a no di disqualification match and the loser has to leave WWE now this made me sad because I don't want to see either of them go because I really feel like the both of them are like really amazing and they're really good stars but in light of everything that happened this past week with the home invasion i'm assuming one of them i guess is going to have to lose and sort of take a break from wwe at this point to um basically gather their thoughts and get themselves together mentally and emotionally from what happened which they have every right to do so this is going to be interesting going forward at SummerSlam. so i'm pretty sure both of them will benefit from this match however it ends because if mandy you know loses you know she'll lose and then we won't see her for a while which kind of sucks but if sonya loses or maybe even if she wins you know she'll wind up looking like a complete bad you know bad a and she'll wind up being more of a vicious heel than possible and mandy will be able to and if she wins she'll be able to prove that she's way more than just a pretty face like everyone says she is but either way i just think it's absolutely commendable that these two were able to go on live television and be as professional as they knew how to be in light of everything that had happened so kudos to those two girls um and also with the women, you had Nikki Cross sort of come out and talk about how she feels like Alexa Bliss hasn't really been herself since she was abducted by the fiend Bray Wyatt. And since she confronted Braun Strowman for having changed and having saying that he really didn't give a crap about her and how he basically lifted her and dropped her and attacked her, you know, last week. So now Nikki Cross is, you know, I guess trying to Re help Alexa Bliss recover from everything that has happened to her and that was really interesting to see and to hear from her seeing as she stabbed um she well she really didn't stab her in the back she basically left her behind to get attacked by the fiend Bray Wyatt so in the midst of all of that amongst the men the show basically started with Vince McMahon coming out to introduce us to the Thunderdome. And I was really going to be excited if and only if he said the Thunderdome in his gravelly dramatic voice. But he was interrupted by The Fiend. And he came out there to sort of look at um, to sort of look at Vince McMahon in kind of a mirror type of deal. But then that got interrupted by Braun Strowman coming out to interrupt the show and all of that was going on. But then Retribution came out to interrupt them. So the lights went out and then Bray Wyatt disappeared, leaving Braun Strowman to deal with Retribution attacking him. But the rest of the SmackDown roster being led by Big E came out and finally they had the upper hand against Retribution and ran them away. So in the midst of all this, Big E and Sheamus had their match, which was really good. It was a good back and forth. But Big E was able to win, not with his submission, but with a roll-up because Sheamus was distracted. So 
that was really good to see that he had won that match, but I'm pretty sure that's not the end of it because Sheamus will feel like, oh, well, you beat me because you were lucky and all the other stuff. So, and then there was a fight outside as the um, members of the SmackDown roster were standing outside of the ring to sort of protect them from retribution. And Baron Corbin was out there, you know, picking at Matt Riddle and basically beat up on him and was telling Shorty G, oh yeah, this is how you do it and all the other stuff. And then they got to fighting outside the ring too, so that's going to still be going on. And then in the midst of the fight with Retribution, Jeff Hardy got attacked by AJ Styles before his Intercontinental title match um, last night. And he wound up having his knee um, braced and so he still went on and fought that match and actually wound up winning the Intercontinental title against AJ Styles which I thought was really cool because there was one point during the match in which Jeff Hardy tried to do one of his moves from the top rope and slipped and fell but he wound up hitting one of his moves from the top rope and winning so that was really interesting to see and then he wound up having his speech interrupted with the music like they do at the Oscars and the Emmys and all that stuff and I thought that was rude but Hardy Gang, Hardy Gang, the championship is back with us. So that's cool. And also, you had a, the tag team championship match between Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura and the Lucha House Party. So now, in this match, everyone showed their best selves with their ability, with the Lucha ability, and of course, with Cesaro and his grappling ability as well. And Cesaro and Shinsuke wound up retaining their tag team titles. But afterward, um, Kalisto, who was out, you know, in their corner, in the corner of the Lucha House Party members, he got in, um, I believe, Grand Metalik's face and was angry at them for losing that match. And they were fussing back and forth at each other. And then the other member, um, Lince Dorado, had to break them up from fighting. And it's looking like they're about to break up which makes me sad because I really feel like um or at least I thought that Lucha House Party was going to give me that three-man tag team dynamic that I was missing from the New Day seeing as Kofi and Xavier are gone now but it's looking like that's not gonna happen so um they're bad seats set in Lucha House Party so hey whatever but at least they're being taken seriously more often than not so that's good and then Bray Wyatt did his Firefly Funhouse where he had Rambling Rabbit and Husky the Pig do a skit as Braun Strowman and Alexa talking about their love story or whatever and how love and Bray was talking about how love can sometimes, you know, eat you alive and how sometimes adults really can't handle what comes with it. And love does have its struggles, but, you know, we're just going to move past that. Um, <laughs> so as this was going on. Braun Strowman attacked him from behind, you know, and dragged him out to the parking lot and then gave him a choke slam onto the concrete. And the producers, you know, and referees wound up helping him into the ambulance that was so conveniently parked out there. And they were getting ready to drive away. But then the ambulance backed up a little bit more. And then inside the ambulance, it went from like blue to red. And then the fiend came out and stood there looking as menacingly as he knew how to look, you know, as if to say he was going to give his revenge to Braun Strowman at SummerSlam in their universal title match. So that's really all that happened on SmackDown, but it was a really solid go home show. So now we're going to go to the conclusion. Right, so we've reached the end of our time together. Thank you so much for listening to my show. And I also want to thank Big Smooth for coming on and giving his perspective on wrestling and his journey um, as an independent wrestler from Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham, stand up. This is our time. Um, thank you so much for coming on my show. Um, you can you already know where you can follow him and stuff. So it's time to put myself over. <laughs> so if you want to, if you want more content from the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, you can listen to me on YouTube, on iHeartRadio, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And if you want to follow me, you can follow me at Hardy Wrestling Podcast on Instagram. You, and on Twitter, you can follow me at Hardy Wrestle Pod. And you can follow me on Facebook at Hardy Wrestling Podcast as well. So 
Um, I hope you enjoyed this amazing wrestling weekend because like I said after last night was Smackdown we have today um, which is NXT TakeOver 30 and then tomorrow we have SummerSlam and there's just so much so many good things going on in wrestling so I just suggest you just focus on that and focus on the happiness that wrestling brings you because this is a big weekend and um, if you are one of those people who did who is participating in the Thunderdome I hope you um enjoyed that and also if you're one of those fans who participate in the virtual meet and greet that some of the superstars are doing like Bailey or Keith Lee and Drew McIntyre I hope you enjoy that as well still find the fun in this weekend even though I know there's a virus going around that basically ruined <laughs> that basically ruined meet and greets and stuff like that um so I hope you have a fantastic weekend. I hope you have an even greater week and I hope you're staying safe and being your best self. And until next time, this is the Hardy Wrestling Podcast with your girl, Stephanie Hardy. Continue to get your chill, passionate and positive vibes here. And I'll see you on the next go round. Bye, y'all.